Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in TNO, that there last days of uh, Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Far Eastern Soviet Socialist Republic. But we've taken out the, uh, well, I guess Divine Mandate of Siberia. Was a little grindy, but overall not too bad, not too difficult, not super difficult, but it just got a little tedious and a little annoying. But we got to talk about a research of motherland. Through these years of struggle, despite countless setbacks, enemies, and challenges, the true government, heir to that of the Soviet Union, is resurgent. We have clawed back a path to victory from defeat, bringing back a sizable portion of land under the rightful stewardship of our vanguard. While records such as Salvin's rebels have tried their hardest to stop our return to greatness, it's with honor that we announce that the motherland is back and stronger than ever. And the roads ahead, there will be challenges, there will be turmoil, but at the end of this, there will be great prosperity as the Union is restored under the watchful protection of the NKVD. There's no turning back now, it's a total reunification of Russia, and there is no turning back, of course. Um, and I do definitely want to extend the administration. As we reclaim more and more land for the motherland, our administration struggles to administer these liberated territories. To accommodate this, we we'll have to extend our political administration to allow us to properly restore Soviet rule to these lands. It's the restoration of Soviet methods of rule, such as the creation of Soviets, collectivization, and the creation of infrastructure for taxation, as well as the movement of men and material, will all be made easier with an extended administration. Uh, with a well-administered base in the corner of Russia, it will provide a solid base of operations for the liberation of the rest of our glorious nation under the banner of the true heirs of the Soviet Union, onwards towards Russia's rebirth. Now. I've already gone ahead and done, um, let's see, we can close out of this one for now, we're trying to core more stuff, which will be very, very important to get higher GDP, we got a lot of stuff that we can do here, which we will do in a little bit, I've already started doing all of this stuff, because we had a lot of political power, but that does leave us with a crap ton of debt, which is very bad, almost 100% already, which is quite god-awful, but we do have a yearly surplus, which is kind of nice, I don't want to lower our real growth for now, but we got to talk about this. Despite the temporary setback suffered since the outbreaks of the Great Patriotic War, the President of the Soviet Supreme, Supreme Soviet has managed to restore the Soviet order and control the revolting areas of eastern Siberia. While most of the technical difficulties we face can be solved by the NKVD, the same cannot be said about the demographic situation of Siberia. Due to inadequate planning by the previous administration, we can only face a labor shortage that, if allowed to persist, will have greater chances of achieving our long-term economic and military objectives. With the foresight of the Soviet state, we've encouraged Soviet women to have more children since 1944. Though scaled back since the relocation of our government to Irkutsk and the re reduction in the available resources that entailed, the reclamation of the Soviet Far East is allowing us to expand the programs beyond the scope implemented two decades ago. Furthermore, with a legitimate Soviet government once more control of the last functioning port in the Union, we can begin to bring home temporarily resettled citizens, Soviet citizens, from abroad by having an adgit prop department encourage returnees, while our economists work on calculating this ideal level of compensation involved in the process. Currently, we operate a downscale version of the population efforts introduced in 1944, where state awards and social benefits are given to patriotic Soviet women who do their part in valiantly fighting the battle for improved demographics, increasing our birth rates by 5%. With increased resources available to us in terms of finances and access to arable land, we currently do not operate any active re remigration programs. By creating social and economic incentives to return and then have our aggregate pop spread information targeting Soviet emigrated communities, we'll be able to encourage Soviet citizens to return home to, new home to the new home of our revolution, expand benefits for patriotic mothers. More growth? Yeah, why not? And then initiate controlled re-immigration re -migration efforts. More monthly population? For every one year, a thousand people shall move to Magana, Magadan, Irkutsk, or Chita. Yeah, why not? And now this one. The Red Navy and its ships were <clears throat> largely destroyed, sculpted left to rot, into scrap metal following the national collapse following the Second World War. Once anarchy gripped Siberia in the 50s, the last vestiges of the Pacific fleet were either destroyed or reduced to piracy around Kamchatka. Now, that order has finally been restored. We have the means to rebuild our navy. The world sees Russia much like it to get rid like, like it's regarded a sunken battleship, a once mighty vessel, left to rot and decay at the bottom of an ocean. While Navy may not be the most practical investment given our circumstances, putting ships to sea will help us protect our trade and for what it's worth. And to show the world that we've recovered from the depths we were pushed by into by proving that we can fend for ourselves once more for both at land, air, and across the Pacific Ocean. Cover Soviet air schematics? Due to the anarchy, the art of advanced shipbuilding has been lost to us. Thankfully, with the administrative facilities of Irkutsk and the ports of Magadan and Kamchatka under our control, we will be able to start building the kind of ships utilized by the USSR during the Second World War. Curtis Fishing Fleet. By converting a portion of our uh, supply fleet into the major shipping vessels, we can make a mark on the Bering Sea and the Sea of Okhotsk. This would not only allow us to feed our people, but <clears throat> let us complement our agricultural sector, which is struggling to develop in the harsh landscapes of the Russian Far East. Oh, yeah. The Osaka Expedition. I think I've heard this before, but our geologists have presented us with an interesting proposal. Within the archives of Irkutsk, all plans were surveyed the northern parts of Saka have been collecting dust. They were expecting to find diamonds and other valuable minerals there, but like so many other great and ambitious projects that were supposed to be part of the Siberian plan. Those two, one fell apart after the Axis invasion of the Union. Now we have a chance to turn these plans into reality. What would likely be a long and costly endeavor, the mere prospect of finding a diamond deposit on the scale of Irkutsk is too tantalizing of an opportunity to miss out on. Whenever the state is ready to allocate resources towards this project, the Army's Engineer Corps stands ready to put their shovels into the hard and inhospitable ground. A glimmering light and a desolate waste. 
<clears throat> sell and convert tank convoys. By converting some of our supply ships for considering use and selling to shipping companies operating in the Pacific, we can earn some extra money at the side to fund other state programs. Oh, this is really good. Yeah, I like this a lot. So, we increase it by... Okay. Yeah, screw that. We, need, we definitely need more money. Oh, Saka Expedition. You're going to remember this, Mr. Grab? The first step of the journey is to restore the roads and railways connections built in the 30s back into acceptable conditions. Jesus will deploy military engineers in the region and have them do heavy lifting so that our civilian experts can safely travel and work within the area. Yeah. Hmm. And it went up slightly more, which is not good at all. But we'll deal with it. As best we can. I'm not sure how well we'll actually be able to deal with this, but whatever. Yearly deficit. No, that's not good. Well, hopefully we can improve our poverty enough that it doesn't matter. We only get two political power a day, though. That's really good. Benefits for the people. Poverty will begin to improve, which is something we definitely, definitely need. Policy cost per capital. Poverty gets better, though. Poverty gets even better. Acceptable minimum wage, huh? Well, we're going to extend the administration no matter what. 0.94 is it jumping up because we have a deficit now. Well, no, it went down. 0.93, that's not bad. Okay, so we have a slightly more growth, which is good. Annual budget is negative 92 million. Return of the Soviets. Just a few years ago, the pres so presidium of the Supreme Soviet's administration uh, oh, uh, hardly extended past the city limits of Irkutsk. That was until General Secretary Yagoda liberated a third, full third of our union from the banished fascist traders and clerics that, or clerics that occupied it. Our status as a true revolutionary vanguard of the Soviet people has been affirmed as, a, as all of the threats in the Far East have been stomped out under the march of history. The Russian proletariat can rest assured that the true heirs of Lenin and Bukharin shall restore the glory and freedom which they lost to the Nazi menace, but our work is still unfinished. There are so many menaces to the West we, we must deal with. Having grown beyond the status of a warlord, we are now a fully functioning state and must develop our national, nation accordingly. We will make great investments into bringing our country up to the standards of the developed nations of the world, and we will now be able to take on a national debt in order to finance our expansions. Our people cry out for help, and the restoration of reunion awaits them, for this point now will not, will not take one step eastward. What's Soviet Russia? The uh, RSD, SDRC convenes. With the anarchy in the Far East finally coming to a close, we need to set out on rebuilding our economy. The situation is, to put it frank, grim. We're suffering from a demographic catastrophe unlike any other in Russia, and are far less developed than the warlords to the west of us, owing to the historical neglect of our region. If we're to stand a chance at uniting the Russian lands under our banner, we must embark on a project of rapid economic and industrial growth. With roughly half a decade to undo, un, uh, to undo a countless years of underdevelopment, we simply don't have a moment to waste if we're to remedy our difficult situation. Let's get to work. Oh, look at this. The Ith Year Plan. Ith Five Year Plan. Thanks to the uh, successful efforts by the NKVD to research Soviet control over the parts over Siberia that were lost in the collapse, the port of Magadan has been liberated. With the present DM of the Supreme Soviet once more in control of the only functioning port in Russia that isn't blockaded by the enemy, it shall henceforth be our window to the outside world and a key strategic compo component in our efforts to reclaim every last inch of Soviet Union that's temporarily been lost to anarchy, fascism, or revisionism. Guiding our efforts to uh, achieve our new economic goals, the Soviet Development and Reform Commission. Established after a move to Irkutsk, it's staffed by the broadest economists in our union. They remain shortly divided, though, with those more closely aligned with the chairman, Genrik Gota, arguing for a transition into a dual economic system that preserves the basic spirit of communism. Those aligned with the party faction, nominally led by Sergei Daddy Besanov, advocate for a more orthodox approach employed by our economic planners in the past. Whichever path we choose, however, we must make sure that the path we, that we preserve the basic spirit of communism has restored Soviet order across our lands. So all this stuff is just kind of going, okay. The eighth five-year plan. Hmm. More debt, huh? Finish the repair of the Baikal Highway. Finish the Amur Highway. Magadan Connection. Restoration of the HSP. Ooh, that's really good. 1% more growth. I like that a lot. Probably gets approved. Ooh, revive the Amur's agricultural sector. <coughs> I want to do all this stuff, obviously. Uh, let's do that one. With the initial underperformance of the last five-year plan remedied thanks to the reclamation of more parts of the Soviet Union and the restoration of its resources to the rightful Soviet rule, the SDRC has revised their projections for the Eighth Plan. With a successful completion according uh, to our economists' projections, the Soviet Union's econ economic strength will surpass what we had before the outbreak of the Siberian War. Restoration of the Irkutsk HSP During the brief time period during which the Soviet Union was limited to merely holding onto the areas of Irkutsk, SDRC made the assessment that our temporary shortage of necessary equipment made it impossible to fully maintain the Irkutsk HSP. As a result, the power station visibly bears the scars of half a decade's worth of maintenance cuts and hasn't been operating in an ideal capacity for decades. Or years, at least. 
to the liberation of the Soviet Far East and its resources, however. We can finally resume our scheduled work and tie it into our plans to expand the planet in the future. Merely catching up on the maintenance work, however, would be more than enough to put us in a position where we can keep our industries going without needing to ration electricity. Uh, revive uh, Amur's agricultural sector. Previously under the control of the vile fascists, the RFP, the fields of Amur have gone from being some of the most productive in Siberia to being a desolate wasteland due to the uprooting of the Soviet central planning of the regime's or regions' farmlands. Ministry of Agriculture and Food have estimated the manpower needed to revitalize the yields and bring them back to the pre siberian war levels, and have suggested that we'll use the current state of hard-fought stability and peace to rotate some of our conscripted peasants back into their older work, and draw on some of the recently liberated population belonging to these last vital economic sectors, and to even out their numbers. While agriculture, agriculture by itself is no longer a key factor in a modern industrialized economy, as was the case during the birth of our union, we can hope to fully, trans, hope to fully transition into one when a good portion of our population could barely scrape by. Look at that debt. Crap. Finish your more highway. Um, and this one too. Hmm. This is the Baikal one first. The M55 highway connecting the temporary Soviet capital of the rest of Siberia has been badly damaged as a result of the recent uprising by the revisionist agitators under Salvin. Although we've already dealt with the punishments for this insurrection, we'll use this as an opportunity to rehabilitate some of his former men by assigning them to a state construction firm. I should be thankful that we're giving them a path back to socialist labor. The other rebels will not be as lucky. How high can we go? 130%? I'm okay with that. And we'll also get up to fair, so that's good too. I'm thinking about temporary tax attack as well at this point. But we'll see. One of the issues noted by our economists is a lack of functional trains and reliable roads as a result of persistent efforts of the enemies of the people to disrupt Soviet rule in Siberia. While those leading out of the temporary Soviet capital are serviceable, the same can't be said about the recently reclaimed areas to the east. It's therefore of the utmost importance that we restore the roads to working conditions so that we may continue with our economic development. So in the past decades, as a part of the Siberian plan, the M58 connecting Chita to Amur was left unfinished due to the Great Patriotic War and the subsequent disruptions of communications. Organizing a supplemental labor battalion out of the RFP prison for the liberation of Amur should ensure the swift completion of the project. Justice will be dispensed, as their masters in Berlin caused this unfortunate delay in the first place. Encourage internal international volunteers in the past. The Soviet Union organized international forces in collaboration with local communist parties, fostering a spirit of solidarity in a collective struggle. A lot has changed since the 30s, and now it's the Soviet Union itself that needs help. As the rightful seat of the Soviet government, will reach out to the remaining Soviet uh, socialist movements of the world to organize volunteer forces to be sent to us through the port of Magadan. Will also help us with our regrettable manpower situation. These men and women are not of the highest quality, even under NKVD supervision. And now we're over our limit here. Be complete modernization? Sure. Um, honestly, at this point, because we already make quite a good amount of manpower, or manpower, political power, I kind of don't mind if we continue doing economic stuff, just because we need some more stuff here. As much as I want to do this and rush down this like I normally do for the bureaucracy and stuff, I kind of want to see the revitalized economic plan, because we need to focus on the economy. With well, glorious reunification, the party is complete. Many celebrate, but the economic theorists of our union are restless. Before them lies accession, accession of the Far East's economy, of duty that many will see as little more than a punishment. But this Herculean task is necessary for the union's future prosperity, and perhaps even survival in the coming struggle of complete reunification. When it is done, a new economic plan is to be drawn, as the plan is old, old. It will define the road to social success that our citizens shall follow, in order to achieve victory in the struggle against imperialistic fascist powers, which reclaim the lost homeland of the revolution. Now, why did it drop so much? That didn't, doesn't explain why it dropped so much. Um, don't get me wrong, I like it like this, but still. Oh, by converting an even larger number of supply ships for civilian use, we'll be able to maintain a significant presence in a claimed nautical economic zone. Nice. Uh, lose some convoys, but you get more better monthly uh, poverty change population agriculture. Yeah, I love what the devs have done with this. This is this is incredibly smart. I do, uh, once again, I do apologize uh, for complaining so much in the last episode. I mean, I just I complain all the time, anyways. But like, I like just it's conflict here it sucks so much. Five year, all oh, available five year plan decisions. And we're highway. Okay, well, we'll see. I'll, I'll ping back, ping before between both of these. But this one next. Benefits for the people. Liberation rush is not just a list of cities. It is the people we free from fascist and reactionary oppression. Therefore, it's important to us that the people we liberate from tyranny are reminded that they've been liberated as they must feel them for themselves to be for a real liberation. Due to this great importance, we must take action to better the lives of citizens are living under our control and give back to our people. The people are and always have been our number one priority, as is their safety. The NKVD will remain a vital part of our administration and will ensure our sa their safety and security is maintained. Glory to the motherland. Liquid reserves? I don't see any liquid reserves. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe we should wait. Okay. Successes of the past. 
The past 20 years have been a true hexscape for the Russia and all her children. And besides the re recent meteoric rise of our legitimate political bureau, there's been a precious little to celebrate. That's not to say, however, that Russia's always been a languishing under a dark cloud. The era of Nikolai Bukharin was a true time of milk and honey. An era where the agricultural circles become the industrial proletariat and the protective watch of the Bolsheviks rather than the adverse blinded capitalists. As we seek to alter our economic policy to fit the tumultuous world of the 60s, we must turn our eyes to the past and recall what made Bukharin's economy so uniquely successful and innovative. His staunch defense and continuation of Lenin's new economic policy tells us that it's necessary to build up the productive forces of the nation before entering a phase of true socialism. As bold Siberian plan continues to pay dividends even in this era of anarchy and opportunist warlords, teaching us that we must industrialize even the most rural regions of Russia. As the version of the collectivization programs encouraged by some of the left opposition allows us, or shows us, that we must not allow ideology to prevent us from pursuing every economic opportunity available. As Russians, the Soviets, the socialists, and members of the Politburo, we are Bukharinists once and all, one and all, and I'm proud thereof. As a union is reborn by our hand, we must and shall adopt a truly Bukharinist model to the needs and wants of the new union of Soviet Socialist Republics and create an economy strong and productive enough to establish socialism no later than 2050. We look to the future. Um, I don't want more debt, but it increases growth by quite a bit. Increases GDP as well. Ooh, by 0.5% though. Ooh. But I also want this one. Oh, where's agriculture at right now, actually? Six? Oh god, we need that badly too. Urban development. Oh, poverty. Oh, the Paris is really line up. Also, I'm not deploying these yet because we can't afford them really to do that yet. So, a city from which we were un which we unified the Far East, <clears throat> Irkutsk, has a glorious history and was one of the most developed even before the old union's demise. However, what was once known as the Paris of Siberia has come out to be in a state of disarray. Many of its buildings are not up to the present standards. Its uh, buildings or its streets unoptimized for modern traffic movement. Its universities and industrial industries are archaic and obstructing the greater economic plans we have for the region. It seems that much of it's like its namesake in 1853. The Paris of Siberia will require a series of renovations to become a modern urban center, while some commerce is postponing it until again we control all of Russia. Comrade Goethe has ultimately decided that this renewal will be vital to the process, a reunification in itself and authorized to start sooner rather than later. Heavy ship program, with the wealth of Siberia to fuel our ambitions to reclaim the seas, still in our efforts to begin heavy ship production. Truly being able to put a relatively modern flagship of our fleet to sea will prove to the world how far Russia has come in our efforts to recover from the anarchy. Naval armory armament? Dockyard output? Yeah, I mean, we get more ships. And by ships, I mean, like, convoys. Which I'm okay with. The Magadan connection, huh? <clears throat> the M56 was an endeavor to connect Magadan uh, to the more temporary parts of Siberia. Many laborers risked life and limb to achieve this monument to socialist progress, but just like we've de they've destroyed so many things in the Soviet Union, the fascists that occupy the port of Magadan have left most of the oblast infrastructure to go to waste. Justice shall be swept, and the NKVD will make sure that a labor detail consisting of Matkatsky's captured men will repair every last inch of the road that they wrecked. Once we have a decent road leading into Magadan, we can finally begin transporting goods to and from the port, which is great. Also, we do have uh, some coffee to keep us nice and warm, so oh, that's always good. And a turn to Leninism. Rutus administration, we're so close to this one, so let's secure the rural regions. Next, we must secure the rural regions. The fields are the home of any good revolution, and the collectivization of agriculture is a vital step in the course of the revolution, also due to the autarkic nature of the economy. A more reliable agricultural supply will do as well to supply the needs of our urban population. The valiant soldiers of the motherland shall sweep the rural regions, wipe out traitors, and bring back order to a great union. We'll rip out the rod reaction and liberal thought from the ruins of the USSR like a farmer pulls a weed from his crop. There is no space for dissent against the vanguard part of the Soviet Union. The world awaits, comrades, za Rodinu. Exploring the pattern of Magadan. Magadan's importance to our economy cannot be understated. In order to open ourselves up to the global economy, we must first improve the harbor to increase its capacity for both imports and exports, as well as expand our icebreaker fleet to the point where we can reliably keep the port open all year round. Once it's done, we can embark on the next step of a five-year plan. Great. <clears throat> nice. Ooh, economic development phase will upgrade. New decisions become available and state GDP modifier. Nice. Paris of Siberia. And almost done with a lot of technology, too. And restore the SSRs first, and then we'll jump back to the economy stuff. One of the great decisions of the USSR was the establishment of the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republics that allowed the minorities of the Union a larger degree of freedom than the land dominated by majorities. We believe this practice must be continued if we're to consider ourselves an extension of the Union, and so these ASSRs are to be recreated to allow the ethnic minorities of our state autonomy. We hope that in making these decisions, we grow ever closer to attaining the legacy of the USSR, and perhaps gaining some legitimacy among other Russian states as a legitimate heir to the Soviet Union for the motherland. Ooh, that's actually really good. We might be able to unify with them later on. Which would be awesome. Awesome possum. Uh, which one do we want? More coffee. That's the one we want. You know, if we're being in the Far East right now, that's not a bad amount of production needs that we have right now. So that's actually not bad. 
Um, oh, state fishing ground. Oh, by expanding fleet even further, we'll be able to increase our fishing activities to the limits of sustainability. So instead of doing this up, we'll do that stuff instead. 90%. Oh, that's pretty high, but our GDP keeps shooting up. Oh, 4% is not bad. No, that's not good. Make sure we don't have a navy, though. Yeah, we have no navy, which is good, because we can't afford it. <clears throat> Sponsor the arts. Well, as much as I want to do maintain cultural restrictions, because that sounds like fun. Ooh, who died? South Africa? No, Muscovine. Pretty much. Um, if you're going to build this one, please go right ahead, because I'm. we won't be going on this way, because we want the party to do really well. But first, I'll come over here. Urban Development Initiatives. With well, recent drive to renovate our goods, plans for similar projects in other cities of the Far East have been brought up by regional committees and individual urbanists of our union. While the present situation necessitates the majority of them to be put off, some of the ideals concerning major centers have been cautiously accepted by the courting authorities. These initiatives cover mostly the matters of infrastructure, ensuring both better transportation within the state and between them. A few of the accepted projects will also deal with the education system, aiming to enhance its facilities to prepare as a future scientific base for the union. 5.03 billion. More growth. That's good. Ooh. Urban development initiatives, more production units. No, I like that a lot. I think regional development, no. Anything up here? Ooh, yes. We are racking up debt like crazy. Begin drilling? With the basic infrastructure operational, again, we can initiate our search for ore clusters. Although we can sell the old Soviet maps and infrastructure, geologists expect a slow process with meager results at first until we manage to find larger mineral reserves and set up modern mining infrastructure around them. Extend the roads. In order to reach more potentially profitable ore clusters, we'll need to expand the road network in the Sakhal region. This time, we'll need to make use of our regular labor force, as well as heavy machinery to make the headway into the region. Well, it's worth it. I promise you, it's worth it. <clears throat> Blue Water Navy? Well, let's see about that. How are we doing for this? Minus point three ones. that's not bad, actually. Sponsor the art? Well, Urban Development Initiatives first. Back in the ASSR. Imperialism is merely capitalism and decay, wrote Lenin. <clears throat> and the imperialist struggle, comp or struggle between nations is nearly as important as a class struggle. To this end, Lenin created the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic so that even small nationals can express the right of self determination within the Russian Federative Soviet Republic. Nevertheless, as the borders expand and more ethnic minorities are incorporated within them, the question of whether or not the existing laws on the autonomy of the ASSRs are sufficient has been increasingly raised. The conservative faction claims that the autonomy they in exhibit currently, that is, the ability to draft a constitution within the bounds of a national constitution, are enough. Critics believe that more autonomy, particularly when it comes to econ economics, must be given to them to minimize gov the gov economic exploitation of these ethnic minorities by the central government. Uh, we must preserve and expand the rights of minorities whenever possible. There is no explanation. Oh, huh. no exploitation in the USSR. Preserve and expand the rights. Highly increases minority rights. Yeah, I'll go to that one. Sponsor the arts. A new Russia, born from the ashes, rises like an eagle as it stretches its wings. Although we have fought hard and bravely for this day to pass, it's important to remember that there's more to the country than warfare. We must devote portions of our budget to cultural advancement. In the form of large endowments to great painters, photographers, and other artists, art will be commissioned for the state, and famous artists will be invited to create new works for the people. Social surrealism is the most socialist of the artistic styles, and as such, must be promoted in our new Soviet state. Murals glorifying the workers' struggle will fill the streets, plastered on the sides of the industrial buildings and apartment blocks. We will rebuild our state on the basis of free cultural expression. Yagoda, huh? Papa Yagoda. How can we tell who has how much influence where what? Uh, for the party versus the everything else. Sponsor that, that, them, their art. <clears throat> Well, I'll do that one first. Thank you very much. Revive the last Soviet program. The battle for the reunification of the motherland isn't just fought on the field of battle with guns and bombs, but in the hearts of our citizens. While we vanquish traitors and restore Soviet rule, it is important that our people are on our side and fully support our campaign of liberation. We must strive towards restoring the patriotism of our people once felt for the Union until in the hearts of every man, woman, and child you can find an undying love for the country. We draw closer to the finish line of the day when all the peoples of Russia may rejoice, and there will be no reactionary fascist capitalists and no traitors that will have reunited this great nation, but the Soviet Union itself. The Workers' Revolution, born in 1917, is still strong, forging an immutable advance towards the liberation of a great country. Absolutely. I can do that one first, that's fine. It's fine. It's monster than their arts. Cultural Revolution. In a speech delivered at the Tikvin 
Ghost on Door Sky uh, Square, the Agoda has announced the beginnings of a new sponsorship program of supporting the arts. Socialism, the liberation of man from the economic chains of Bynum, the Agoda said to the crowd assembled in the city square. It's only under socialism that the man will finally be able to free, uh, be free to express himself without being bound by market demand. The new cultural programs unveiled by the Yogoda this afternoon is extensive, starting from the next fiscal year. The sale will be granting endowments to painters, authors, filmmakers, and other artists with a particular focus on social surrealist art that can be easily accessed, and understood by the working class in the form of sculptures, murals, and films glorifying the struggle for the proletariat from the 1917 onwards. A new museum of socialist art is also in the planning stage, which will showcase the best places of Soviet artwork to be the world. The flower of socialism culture, uh, socialist culture blossoms. Read like the transib. Egalitarian schooling. <clears throat> Academic base. Oh, that's not bad. Got some more money, though. Oh, but more taxable population, too. Hmm. Agriculture. While the party might be split over the question of what role should the state have in the process of industrialization, it's largely united when it comes to the policies required to revitalize the agriculture of the Union. Though the present economic plan is largely centered around industrial developments of urban centers, the courts are predominantly gearing rural areas have gone up as well, and several initiatives for intensification of their economies have already come up. One more ambitious proposal is to revive the machine tractor stations. Local enterprise from ownership and maintenance of agricultural machinery, established in the late 20s, has a lot of underperforming so-called to modernize with a state investment, leading to a considerable increase in agricultural output. But some comments from yesterday included, Will you do the military path for the PRC sometime in the future? Sure. Just let me know about it. I won't remember it, but let me know in the future, and I'll probably do it. Oh, do Ooh, look at all this stuff. Someone says, You need plays cheated if they have a focus sheet, which I've already had plays cheated before. Someone says, Best enough wholesome moment. Someone else says, The Red Menace. Someone else says, Didn't expect you to play Rakutsk once again. And someone also says, And the same person says, Japan's getting a rework with new faces. And another person said, We would build the, the Soviet version of China. Cool. Oh, crap, this is going to cost so much money. Trade with the developing world. Ooh. Ooh, eighth if I playing miscellaneous income. Ooh, more growth. More growth. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, admin efficiency begins to improve too. Ooh. Ooh, that's really good. Oh. Our renovation and revitalization of the current sea of Soviet power must not be a half measure. As the most advanced city in the Soviet Union, Irkutsk shall be it shall take the first steps in beginning, becoming or being a modern economy. Avoiding reckless marches into the unknown will limit the Union's evolution into a more contemporary economic model to take on the shapes of gradual steps, starting out by tweaking the legal frameworks for the businesses in the city as well as investing, and the creation of state service to the company. Whereas we relied on raw industrial strength in the past, the economy of the new Union should be known for its efficiency as well. We can only do so much here right now, so. 4% more growth sounds really good, but more miscellaneous income is good as well. Oh, I want... Hmm... Infrastructure as well. Oh, that's 0 0.05. But we get more growth as well. I'm going to do some trade with the developing world. Where economy was never officially closed. It has understandably been struggling due to the anarchy put, putting development into a state of objective stasis. Despite the many disagreements that you go to and the party factions have. This is one area where they seem common ground is trade with friendly neutral states in Asia and across the Pacific and work in harmony both with the old Bukharanite system and coexistence within, with, between Marxism and capitalism envisioned by some of our new economists. With products to offer the world and a profound need for goods to bolster our economy, we'll initiate efforts to restore trade ties with the former partners of the developing world and seek out new trade ties as well. <clears throat> Modernize Irkutsk HSP. The turbines used in the Irkutsk HSP linger back to the days of the Siberian plan. Well, not a direct target in any recent wars, the aftershocks caused by the fall of Moscow and the Siberian War can still be felt to this day. <clears throat> by purchasing equipment on the foreign markets and hiring experts to help us modernize the plans to the standards of the decade, the pro provisory capital of the Union will be ranked among the most important electri electricity production stations in all of Asia. Needless to say, this will go a long way to achieve the goals of our five-year plan by ensuring plentiful, plentiful electricity day and night, all year around, for both common citizens, state industries, state industries and investors alike. And we're out of political power. Dang it. Beneath the surface of Siberia last vise untapped riches. Coal, gold, diamonds, iron ore, and a myriad of valuable minerals are right at their fingertips. Sadly, cannot be currently excavated due to many of our mines falling in disrepair during the anarchy. By importing equipment and schematics from abroad, we can undo years of decay and short order. With improved access to the outside world comes the obvious benefits of having easier access to industrial equipment. While our landlocked rivals in the West struggle to get their hands on modern machineries that are surrounded by un uncooperative rogue states, our access to the sea changes its situation entirely. With a recent expansion of Malgadon's facilities, we're in a good position to report the kind of machinery we need to revise our industrial economy. We have your, your surplus, which is good. I don't want to hurt a growth too much. If we did a temp tax hike, we don't get that much money anyways. Expenditure is quite a bit. Military is not costing. It's not costing us a little bit, but if we're cutting it down by twenty percent or fifteen percent, it's not going to do very much. <sighs> we're caught between a rock and a hard place right now. We need proletariat patriotism. Oh, do we have? Do we have liquid reserves? Yeah, it's not much. 
Good evening, comrades, and the voice over the crackly radio. We will be departing from a previous programming in the time slot from now on. Comrade de Gordis wisely concluded that these prime hours should be filled with inspirational messages about our beloved motherland. To that end, we'll have one of the finest Soviet actors in the studio with us tonight to read a pre-war or a war-era poem which is most dear to our Russian hearts. Vasily Alexeyevich, if you would. The young actor began reading out loud. His voice came in beautifully over the airways. Listeners in taverns paused their con conversations and inclined their ears. Because we are Russian, just fire and destruction, are we... Are all we abandoned behind as we go? Are in fighting beside us? Our comrades are dying, and we Russians to only die facing their foe. Alicia, until now we've been spared by the bullet, but when for the third time my life seemed to end, seemed to end, I yet still felt proud of the dearest of countries, the bitter, great bitter land I was born to defend. Even the most jaded of listeners felt a fire stirring in their heart that these old words brought to life. Some of the younger ones even began to consider enlisting the Red Army themselves. If the people were not in love with the motherland before, they were passionately now. Remember, Alicia, the roads of Smolensk. The Silent Revolution. The ship began during Salvin's Rebellion, and at first it was barely noticeable. One week, a few token responsibilities would be transferred from the Premier to the Presidium, and the next uh, army would gain a small measure of autonomy from the NKVD. This was undeniable, though. Yugoda's clique click was losing control of the Union, and more ideological members of the Presidium were stepping in to take charge. A silent bloodless revolution was underway that would return the Soviet Union to Lenin's founding vision. With the power now secure, the Presidium has drafted a bold new set of reforms to be implemented. From expanding voting rights to issuing, issuing universal identification, the party hopes to turn away from the cloister dictatorship that Yugoda and the NKVD fostered. Under Lenin, the Union was strong and prosperous, returning to his plans for Russia is the only way to reclaim that all has been lost. Reclaim all that has been lost. Ooh, let's do rapid factory modernization. Oh man, we are shooting up high. God dang, this sucks. 140%. Growth is still not. Oh, we don't have enough political power for that. It's fine. <laughs> Even higher. Return to Leninism. When Bukharin took the reins after Comrade's death, no one could have guessed the consequences. The need for a strong state to guard the revolution was used as an excuse to establish a dictatorship more interested in maintaining power over advancing uh, the revolution. Bukharin let the Union grow weak and failed to defend it when the Germans invaded after you go to seize power from the problems only worsened. He reduced the Union to nothing more than an NKVD's client state that paid lip service to the revolution and nothing else. It's far past time we return to the original course Lenin set for us. There must be a true dictatorship of the proletariat, not simply a bourgeois dictatorship dressed in red. The liberation of the working class must always be at the forefront of our minds. This commitment to the revolution may not be popular with some of the old guard, but since, but since when have the revolutionaries cared what the bureaucrats think? Not much, but we can do as much as we can with that. What are we up for this? That's not bad. Poverty rate is only 57% already. Holy crap, that's actually pretty good. Especially in the beginning of 1967. Go ahead, that's fine. We're not at quite 140% yet, so... Sideline so the state faction. Replace the nomenclatura. Ooh. Administration purged. I wrote the security street. Um, why not? I wrote the security edifice. Under Yagoda's rule, from the, so the Soviet government became little more than a glorified rubber stamp, existing only to legitimize the real master of the Union, the NKVD. Over the years, the nation was transformed into a securocracy, bureaucracy, a government run by and for the intelligence services. Even as the NKVD friendly state faction declines in irrelevance, many of the administrative structures and loopholes that they put in place for Yagoda's henchmen remain. If it eliminated these loopholes, it would go a long way towards relegating the NKVD back to its original purpose, protecting the revolutionary state, not controlling it. Reducing the NKVD's role in the government would also ease the administrative burden we are currently grappling with. Fewer people being consulted, and an improved delegation of responsibilities would make it easier for the Presidium and its agencies to take decisive action. Cool. And what do we have over here? The open coastal city of Magadan? As we advance towards the realization of Yago's China, I simply put theory into practice. Magadan will be the first city where we will initiate a full-scale experiment in our new economic theory of two systems coexisting in the Union, reaping the rewards of a more modern economy while preserving the Marxist ideals of a revolution was founded on. In the Industrial Harbor of Magadan. Low seeking to betray the revolution and compromise with capitalism, having lost the economic debate, it's time for us to move forward re towards reaching the goals of our five-year plan. Through a heavy industrialization scheme that builds upon the success of the Siberian plan, we'll also learn from its mistakes and bring more prosperity to the Union. Cool. Even more money? Let's hope so. Oh, convert. Ooh. The USSR has endured in the form of our sailor. The Presidium and Central Executive Committee of the Union both make their homes in Kutz and exist as continued legislative authority within our state. Two factions make up the government, of course, uh, party and the state. However, you want to read these again, please go ahead. I guess I read that last time. Look at life. 
A big year for Ivan Graichiov. By working for Go Goskodnitsyn, the state committee on the prices, he knew the legal price of every single item in the union. And ever since General Secretary got it raised his and every other civil servant's salary, he would be able to afford much more of those items. His dinner tables never lacked meat, and his new car was never out of gas. The car was his product of purchase. Even with his new salary, he had to save up to afford it. And then there was a waiting list and all the hopes he had jumped through to he didn't get an American car imported in Siberia. But by New Year's, he'd be a proud owner of a new Ford. That New Year's even. He decided to show it off to all his co-workers at Goskom 10. He rode the engine and did donuts in the front yard. He invited his favorite colleague to go out and ride down the streets of Akutsk. He was frowned upon by the police, but he'd earned this. He got it himself, had approved his salary, his time he lived well and fastened for once. But he also spent of that new salary on fine and poured it to Cognac that night. Such is the price of luxury. That's the general secretary. End of Yagoda. Regional councils. Ooh. Promote the young bureaucrats. Ooh, look at that. I like that one a lot, actually. Universal identification. All right. Current days are past. Encourage social egalitarianism. Not bad. But I want to do this one first, because this will help with academic-based poverty and stuff like that. And get 50 political power back. The new graduate. Years later, a Leonid Mikhailovich Morozov would remember the school breeze blowing off in the off of Lake Baikal as he submitted his application to the Gospel Plan office in Irkutsk. And Omen, he would say, accompanying his words with a slight smile. A man from of a family of little standing and no influence, Morozov was the first of graduates from the university's ordered, reopened, and available to all, by a party decree. When he had seen the advertisement, positions available for junior state planners, his father told him not to bother. Such jobs went to men of connection, he had said, but not uh, such as men as he. But Morozov was a true believer in the inherent equality of socialism, and he would not be deterred. He wanted to serve his country and citizens, and he knew he was capable of doing so. The men who had controlled things for so long were not only old, they were largely not even from Siberia. Arkutsk was not Moscow, and Siberia was not Western Russia. The lands, challenges, and people were different, and the new union required new administrators if it was to prosper and combat the reactionaries, the despots, and occupiers that still held most of Russia in the grasp. When he returned home the evening after submitting his application package, having waited five hours in line to do so, and he said as much. His father only had scowled. It was the time he was told, but he wanted to sleep at night. Morozov felt certainly certainty in his future. He would be given his opportunity. After all, the party had promised equality. Are you hopeful for the future? Recess political uh, per imprisonments? Uh, I'll probably use that manpower right now. Or political power, I should say. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Please. Oh! Uh, the mere excavation. It seemed that more pessimistic geologists were correct so far as few minerals were within a reach. A significant amount of the valuable ores are located so far north and in conditions that are so inspitable that makes any kind of mining operations impossible. But we found areas where diamonds that fit for industrial use can be excavated and large enough quantities to be somewhat profitable. By bringing in more equipment, the Melanie mine ought to be fully operational within half a year. And the Odashanya excavation. Although it would be hard to turn a profit with the current equipment, the discovery of yet another diamond pop outside the Arctic Circle has made it obvious this is at the very least a worthwhile long-term investment. Setting up a permanent presence in the area will begin the long process of turning these fields into proper pit mines for large-scale excavation. To facilitate this, large state funds will be invested in to improve the old Soviet railroads in the region to help with the transportation of goods to and from these new industrial centers. With that, we can consider the Saka expedition to have been a costly success, but a success nonetheless that will pay off in the long term. Point one. Oh, good God. Yeah, we'll do that one. We'll do both. Screw it. Cares about the debt, right? That's only 112.5%. That's all. Um, well, this one helps reduce admin strain as well. So let's do this one first. Many people are under the impression that communism is inherently tyrannical. And those that saw you go to the 10 years premier could be forgiven for believing that, but it's not true. Lenin called for a dictatorship of the proletariat, but this sort of dictatorship is not mutually exclusive with democracy. While the Communist Party is a vanguard of the revolution and must always maintain control over the revolutionary state, a form of limited democracy within the party can be allowed. Under the system, will allow party members, who have worked within the government for at least uh, four years, are found to be in good political and moral standing to vote on various matters, of course. Only Communists will be allowed to vote and run for office, but a limited form of democracy will prove to the people that we're not just another despotic government. The new bureaucrat. Uh. Um, yeah, so, if you're going to be the best part of the case of morals off again, met by a junior supervisor. He was quickly given his identification badge and shown around the office. As he moved from room to room, he could not feel but wonder. The university taught him that, apart from the politi uh, political reliability, little is more important to a state than its economy. And for the union, that economy down to the last sack of corn was controlled from here. He could tell, however, that he was not going to be welcomed by many. That looks that followed him from the senior planners told him as much, but he would not be intimidated. He'd been taught in the comms com comms that change was always resisted by those who had accumulated power, and sadly, even once committed socialists were not immune to perpetuating such per uh, uh, resistance. Uh, when he showed into his office, there were purpose broom claws with little more than a rough hewn desk, a mismatched chair, and a plastic telephone. He knew that those looks had been followed by deeds, but he would be responding in kind. Looking at the stacks of graphs, reports, and production figures that had been stacked in the corner, he felt power run through him. He would learn the union's economic anatomy. 
but diagnose illness and would prescribe treatment. The party demanded loyalty, yes, but it also required the confidence that he possessed. So it's time to go to work, a chance to prove himself. Further, just further family incentives? Great ideal re immigration location. Huh. Resettlement program. Party was slightly worsened, which is something an option I almost never choose, but you know what? At this point, we need it. I'll bargain with the officers. Military professionals begin to uh, slowly improve. Ooh, miscellaneous cost for 90 days, that sucks. Okay. And the struggle between the party and the state. One of the most loyal allies was the Red Army. Their strong opposition to the NKVD interference in their work made them our natural partners, but with our common enemy now reduced their relevancy. There's a little left to unite us. To avoid allowing any distance to form between the Union's government and its military, a few members of the President have recommended striking a bargain with the Red Commanders of the Red Army. This deal would involve alleva allocating more of the budget to the military to fund modernization efforts and improvements to the training curriculum. The generals have clamored for more funding for some time and granting it to them will strengthen the bonds between the uh, Communist Party and the Red Army. I also have the added benefit of strengthening their military for a future conflict, which seems likely if Russia is to be reunited, of course. The New Generation. Though uh, Leonid Morozov was a committed socialist, even he had doubts, very deep within him, that the party would continue hiring graduates such as him for the important organs of state, but as he learned in short order, his doubts were unfounded. He had not been in position long before he started noticing a commonality among the other junior planners. Many were from his university, or others, or similar smaller ones. After all, including himself, were close in age. With them changed the atmosphere of the Gospel office as a whole. Unlike the lethargy, had once dominated it, and had started to get on him once the initial excitement had worn off. There was now a collective energy and drive that, was that he was proud to be of. Problems that existed for years were solved through collective uh, <clears throat> innovation. Production pipelines were optimized. Industries were integrated horizontally and vertically. Workers were reassigned and relocated to maximize skill overlaps. Sources of waste, human or otherwise, were pursued, identified, and ruthlessly eliminated. And with every improvement and the overall projections improved, things had begun to change indeed. The senior planners no longer looked at him and the other young arrivals with disdain. No, now they looked at them with fear. They knew that things were changing, and the party had seen the value of bringing a new generation of administrators into the fold. And they knew that they would soon be swept away. Morals have looked forward to it. A new generation for a new union. What's this? An ideal room. Oh. Oh, we got the slight money. Okay, so that looks a lot better. Oh, maybe not a lot, but ooh. Nice. Why not? Screw it. Um. Sure, why not? We get more growth. Industrial, strategic, and development. Our union, brought back from a life of stasis, finds itself in a world very different from the point of its collapse. The previous mixed system of rural agrarianism, combined with the industrialization of urban centers, is unfeasible within the present economic international realities. <laughs> in fact, agriculture's contribution to the average country's GDP no longer constitutes the majority. The dominant economies of the world are approaching a new model largely oriented towards the service sector and an integration of recent technological development into practice. What that means for us, simply speaking, is that we need to catch up with the rest of the world. While some plans for rapid modernization have been outlined, it has been decided that the matter should rather be approached cautiously. A reckless transition straight to a service-based economy will only harm the union in the long run. For now, we must go through an evolutionary path and focus on properly restarting the key industrial centers of the Far East. Good. Good, good. Oh, no, I want to do all this stuff, but we can't. We're a banner Pacific lead. If you want to do this stuff, please go ahead. I was worried about this, so we can't do any of this stuff. God dang it. The man who arranges the tanks. Pavel had accounted and recounted, and then recounted one more time just to make sure that he could not eat, deny reality any longer. There were 50 IFVs in the vehicle d depot he was responsible for. To most people, this did not seem like an issue. They would make the count, record the number, and move on with their lives, but Pavel was not most people. He took his job as a logistics officer seriously, and this was des depot was his number one priority. Nothing came in or out without him making a record of it, except now that it had, because this week he counted 50 IFVs. Last week, there were only 45. There were more main battle tanks as well, but that did not concern him. It's in the truck that <clears throat> brought him in, signed off on the paperwork, and told the driver there, or here, he could find a good drink in the nearest town. He expected 38 main battle tanks, but he cannot explain the five extra IFVs that bothered him. Where'd they come from? Why were they here? Had they been sitting on accident, or had someone else forgot to tell him about a delivery? The bell is going to get the answers. He burst into the depot guard's office, starting with the guard on duty here, comrade. I need to see the records from last week at once, please. The guard looked at Pavel for a moment before speaking. I'm sorry, comrade uh, sergeant, but I can't give them to you. I have an order not to allow anyone to see these records. By who, Pavel bellowed? I have authority over this depot. It is my responsibility. I'm sorry, sergeant, but they ordered me not to say anything. I didn't get their IDs anyways. They just told me that the ranks, and I let them do what they wanted. Uh, Private, are you aware that we have five extra IVs in the lot right now? Pavel hissed. Wait, we have a surplus? That doesn't seem so bad. Not so bad. It's a catastrophe. Um... Uh... Okay. And the stuff, uh. Oh. 
Because I do want to do more poverty stuff. Like, poverty is the most important thing to get rid of right now. Actually, where are we at? 96%, that's not bad. Ooh, social spending, yes. Hey, surplus, not bad. 5% growth, pretty good. Compromise on imports. More growth? Why not? Ooh, actually, agriculture. Where are we at for agriculture? Did it go up yet? No. 12? Uh, we wait a little bit longer. We'll do one more before we do that one. Uh, a recess of political imprisonments. There's no question the gulags are an important necessity. Since Lenin's original revolution, there's always been people who refuse to accept our rule and attempt to disrupt their society. There must be somewhere to see to send these people. During the reign, reign of the NKVD, the people, the number of people, sent to the gulags greatly increased, and many of those imprisonments were not justified. Many women who are proud revolutionaries and dedicated members of the Communist Party were imprisoned simply for questioning a good and his allies. We must correct this. The files of every political prisoner must be reviewed to see uh, which ones are suitable for release. By officially redeeming these prisoners, we will not only be regaining many bright minds and strong bodies will serve the Union, but we will have earned their undying loyalty as liberators as well. Alright, we gotta do poverty relief, right? Uh, more growth. Poverty will begin to improve. This one's not bad either, because poverty begin to improve as well. But agriculture goes up as well. But we wanna wait, because agriculture is already doing very well for us. So I'm convert. Oh, I'm, we're gonna do this like every single time as much as we can. And sideline the state faction. The state faction, consisting of the NKVD, Hugo de Zogard, and the more conservative members of the Presidium, once ordered coots with an iron fist. Their pragmatism was essential to the Union's survival in the dark days of that followed the collapse of the war against fascism, but now the time has passed. With the party consolidating its hold on the government, working across the aisle with those in the state faction are no longer necessary. We can begin relegating them to unimportant duties where they will be unable to extract their work. Many of the more, more, most talented bureaucrats and government workers are members of the state function, faction. The loss of their skills and experience will be something of a setback, but we cannot afford to have counter-revolutionaries sabotaging our government from within. Once we issue all the reassignments, the party controls of the nation will be total, and the way forward of the Union's reclamation will be finally be clear of internal obstructions. And replace the nomenclatura. The nomenclatura is an informal upper class of our society made up of higher-level bureaucrats and administrators. They have significant influence on the government, the party media, and almost every industry in the state. While all of them are registered members of the Communist Party and claim to be dedicated revolutionaries and practice they represent a new elite that rules over the workers while trying to run the nation for their own benefit. It's no surprise that the nomenclature are almost universally supporters of the state faction that would preserve the status quo they thrive in. If we want to call ourselves a real revolutionary government, we'll have to put an end to this new bourgeoisie. There's no doubt that they will use their ample resources and influence to oppose us. Without purging so many experienced bureaucrats with her administration, but these are the sacrifices a land and a state must make, or uh, must be willing to make, to achieve a true communist society. Down with the old. It was over, the jig was up. After everything in his career had endured, Vasily Sukhovsky almost couldn't believe that he'd been undone by a bureaucratic shakeup. He had survived the flight from Moscow, the Siberian War, Salvin's Rebellion, and the reunification of the East. Through all the trials and tumult the Union had endured, he had served the post as an undersecretary of the Revolutionary Education, collecting a generous paycheck for his service while working as little as he was required to. He used to fear that his relaxed attitude towards his work might one day earn him the bullet of the noose, but eventually he'd come to see that his superiors didn't want ambitious and motivated men in the government. They wanted men like Vasily, who were looking to do as little as it, as it took to live comfortably in an uncomfortable world. For almost two decades, Vasily thrived within this cult of mediocrity, content in their certainty that he would be collecting his paycheck until he died, and it seemed the new bosses weren't as happy with that idea as Vasily was, as evidenced by the pink lip that now sat on his desk. In the coming days, Vasily heard from many of his co-workers who had experienced the same thing. No warning or hint that anything is amiss, and then suddenly one day his job you've held since 1938 isn't yours anymore. Some of his comrades were righteously angry at their dismissal, insisting that they could never be replaced and that the Union was doomed without them. It was mostly hot air, though. The old men who now spent their days uh, crowded into bars complaining to each other were not the type to give their life to the revolution. Vasily had spent three decades working 12 hours a week and had completed a single major project or initiative in the past 10 years. His comrades were no different. Deep down, Vasily knew they deserved to be fired. Darn if he wouldn't make, he wouldn't miss a paycheck, though. Perhaps he should have shown more initiative, and the revolution renewed. Our enemies in the state faction told us that we could never succeed without them. They said that we were too idealistic, that we should leave the government to them. We were told to stick to theorizing about revolution and inspiring the masses to support, support the Union while they ran the show. They said that we wouldn't know how to run a nation and we would fail without them. We have proven them wrong. There's no denying that, they are, uh, that at first, there were difficulties. The bureaucracy had to be purged of those who tried to oppose us, leaving many of our departments gutted. The fact that we had just reclaimed a huge stretch of territory did not make establishing a new system any easier, but we learned as we went and it consolidated our control. Now our rules in question across all of eastern Siberia. Every town from Rakutsk to Kamchatka flies the red banner, knowing that they serve the revolutionary state. Lenin's dream is not dead, it's only just beginning end. We'll finish this part of the focus tree with the proletarian dictatorship forever. 
The road we have traveled one has not been easy. The chaos of the October Revolution, the fascist invasion, the flight to Irkutsk, and the treachery of Salvin's partisans. We face countless challenges and now have overcome them all. Now, after decades of struggle, we finally reclaim the eastern part of our glorious union. Peace and prosperity have returned to the war-torn land, and all across Siberia, the people are celebrating our return to power. Some celebrations certainly do, but our task is far from over. To west are traders and rulers who seek to steal Russia for themselves. Beyond them lie the Nazis who still enslave many of our people. We have not faced our last challenge, but we will overcome these new foes just as we defeated those who came before them. The great drive to the West has come in this time the revolution of the proletariat will not be stopped so easily. The revolution renewed, of course. On, the, uh, on every wall in the Far East, a propaganda poster displays Bukharin's face, or face, proudly relaying the same message, the air of despotism is no more. The Ogoda China? The long years of political repression carried out by the former NKVD chief? As a distant memory, with the orthodox Bukharin swinging the party firmly back in control of the government. On the ground, people breathe a little easier, as the previous on the present NKVD units seemingly disappear from the street corners and their prisons relatives slowly trickle back from the camps. On the halls of power, bureaucrats rejoice at their luck. The blue cap reaper has been forever exercised, and they are no longer the securocrats sec hostages. The party's historians are hard at work catalog cataloging and decrying the previous administration's abuses, though perhaps not the ones the new authorities were complicit in. Reams of documents and posters praising a good are quickly destroyed, or quietly destroyed, statues of them. Many erected triumphantly only months ago come down in favor of more palatable statues of Lenin, Marx, or Bukharin. You good supporters may lament the party coup as betrayal of socialism and unity, but, too, the rest of the population is ouster is met with a cautious welcome. It may be the Soviet successor you go to bell, but without it, many believe out, ouster is proof that the party can take a kind of path. Those who took partook in the revolt have yet another question to ponder. Valerie Salvin's dead, but perhaps he got what he wanted in the end. Socialism's course has been corrupted. Yeah, so we're all done with that. Let's get some better planes. And we'll also grab construction. Yeah. Oh, we have liquid reserves. Oh, it didn't help out a ton, but you know what? We got a good yearly plus now. That's actually pretty gosh darn solid, not gonna lie. Education, where are we? Academic base versus research. Um, honestly, research might be better to do right now. Let's that one. Nice. And compromise on imports. Did I read about this one? Uh, not really. Ever since the bitter defeat of the Union and its relocation of Siberia, the question of protectionism dominated the disputes regarding the matters of Soviet agriculture. With the soils of the Far East far from fertile, especially when compared to the fields of the Russian plain, a certain amount of products would be imported, potentially harming local production. Now, with the Far East reunified under the rightful authority of Comrade de Goethe's government, this question rises again. Fortunately, the Union's economists have found a compromise solution. It calls for a complex system that ensures import contracts are scaled in accordance with the fulfillment of the economic plan. This policy of streamlined properly will encourage uh, domestic production of goods that will uh, be otherwise be imported without devolving into outright autarky. The union marches forward. As yet another presidential meeting, meeting concluded, and uh, members, regardless of committee to disperse, all felt that a sense of calm routine and return to the union. There are many reasons for this, and one had, had asked that they would have heard different opinions from different people. Some would say that the resolution of the long-held struggle between cliques of the party and state officials had finally brought internal stability and consolidation. I'll say that the reunification of the Far East approved the legitimacy of the Presidium's construction and allowed for a more true proletarian nation to once again emerge. Whatever the true reason, none can deny that the state was a far cry from the out of only a few years prior, and internal divisions have been removed. Lands have been acquired. Economic and social activities were increasing, foreign relations were being established, and providing the means by which all this has been accomplished, the Red Army served as a modern professional experience and deadly force. There will be many more challenges and tribula tribulations in the future, but those who sought thought that such things new, but they would be overcome. The people of government and state would act in unison and return to the promise of true socialism to all in Russia, for the Union marches forward. Features ours. Plus, General Secretary, we can do that, but... Uh, I want to get everything else first. The rise of Sovnarsky. Universal identification. We get more stability. Mm, you know what? Encourage socialist egalitarianism, which kind of is kind of the opposite of what we're doing here anyways. We'll do this one anyways first. Screw it. Why not? Alright, education, academic base, like I said, it is almost about to go up, so give it like another month, it'll be good. Uh, let's look at land reforms, give more monthly population, and increase GDP by 5%. Purpose Soviet infrastructure is not bad. Import heavy machinery, we can do that one maybe. And I do egalitarianism. Yeah, we can do this one. All of the message of socialism is inherently egalitarian in theory, promising the emancipation of the common man or woman from the true oppression. It's often not to convert it properly into practice, and a truly social state is unacceptable, and thus as another party memories and varied reforms is now to be addressed. This campaign, oh no, effective immediately, and in keeping with examples of women and proudly serving beside their comrades at almost all levels of the armed forces, gender-based discrimination will no longer be permitted in any setting or workplace. Prominent party figures, male and female, spoke across various forms of the state media on the need for the initiative, and announced the commencement of a campaign to promote the newfound praise of true equality in all areas. 
This campaign will include the identification of female heroes as social labor, a campaign of awareness for the roles of female soldiers can and do excel within the armed forces, and the establishment of a committee to investigate possible bias in state communications. Equality exists within the vanguard of socialism, and the party has proven its dedication to ensuring those ideals at all levels of society and true Marxist Leninist fashion. Equality for all the social state. That goes the Siberian plan. Transitional approach. Ah, if you want to about this one, please go ahead. Partition of the coast. Form other uh, special economic sectors. Interesting. Invite Boeing. Invest in transportation. And our arrival for the sphere. That looks actually pretty awesome, actually. But of course, we'll go with echoes of the Siberian plan. After a series of debates, including those in the role of the state and the economy, the anti bukharist revisionist Democrats have been exposed and it announced by those truly loyal to the party and its efforts in building socialism. The new economic policy has once again been rebuilt, rebuilt the Union from the devastation brought on by the Civil War. It rebuilt the Union once again from the ruins of the collapsed Russia. It has thus decided that the Siberian plan, which was aimed at developing the economy of the region after the Union's government was forced to relocate east, shall be continued, albeit with a few corrections. Now, notably, the party's main target being the complete reunification of the lost territories, noticeably major share of investments is being devoted to military production and heavy industry. The industrial harbor. Nice. Resource efficiency gain, construction speed goes up. Not bad. Nice. Uh, give us another day and then we'll do education. That'll be great. Even though our G debt is still higher than our GDP, but whatever. And if you'd like to about improve academic base, please go right ahead. That's something to be celebrated. Nice. Lessons from Ajuquo. Ooh, rapidly improve external equipment or expertise. This one's still going up. Expertise, we're going to wait. Let's do equipment first. Import industrial machinery. Uh, as the old Siberian plan mostly centered the state investments on heavy industrial buildup, our present economic apparatus shall tow the slime. However, it faces a series of problems, the most important of which is the loss of a considerable amount of industrial equipment over the process of collapse and the subsequent restoration of the Soviet power in the Far East. While the existing production complex can be rerouted towards the machine industry to replace the absent pieces of machinery, it would completely derail the plan and serve as a complete irrational waste of resources. It has been instead been decided to import the missing parts of the production cycle so that the domestic industry can focus on the original goals of the economic plan. Up with the new. The office was not as large as Boris had hoped, and there was no chair or windows either, which didn't help with the press aesthetic that characterized the entire building, of course. It would have to do. Boris was not here for a nice office or a good view of Irkutsk. He was here to revitalize the Soviet school system. The last undersecretary of revolution education had allowed the Union schools to fall into stagnation, and thousands of citizens or children have been given inadequate education as a result. Boris was going to put a stop to it. His head was already spinning with the ideas and plans of how he would rebuild the Union schools. The first step would be creating a new generation of textbooks. Covering everything, from the sciences to Russian history. As far as Boris was aware, there hadn't been a new educational text published in Russia since the Second World War, meaning that any school lucky to have textbooks would rely on information that was 30 years old at best. After the textbook had been printed, he could have been going organizing a nationwide initiative to train and hire more teachers. After that, the foundations would be laid for his most ambitious plans. New schools, both primary and secondary, would open in every city and town across eastern Siberia, heralding a new age of revolutionary schooling and societal progress. Perhaps even a new university to serve as the crowning achievement or even... A knock at the office door broke Boris out of his daydreaming. He saw his assistant had returned with a tower of boxes containing the documents and records that Boris needed. Sorting through the mall would take all night. Boris sighed, grabbing a box and dug in. Before he could enjoy the glamour perks of his job, he would have to earn them. Oh well, he thought. Millions have been given their lives to the Union. At least I can offer my... Oh, at least I can offer is my time. We will not wait for the future. Transitional approach. Echoes of the Siberian plan. Oh, so we can't do this one. We can do the Industrial Harbor. Okay. And then the shipyards of Amur. Oh, actually, we really get get more convoys, but that's fine. Cool. Very nice. Shipyards of Amur. When we feel the fascist clique of Amur, we reclaim the small coastal town of Chumakan, long ago occupied by the so-called All Russian Government. With well, the most recent records we have from 1939 listed as barely more than a fishing village. It seems that Rozhevsky's bandits developed its port out of necessity, so that the Japanese could properly supply their laptops with equipment and provisions. Fortunately, the crude transportation hub can be repurposed into a proper trading port and a building and shipbuilding facility. 
Upwards, Magadan, and Petropavlovsk, Kapchatsky could fulfill the task already. They are poorly connected with the regional center. Additionally, suboptimal climate may render them unusable over the cold periods of the year. Thus, Chumakan has been designated as the most economically viable port and is to be developed accordingly so that a union can establish a naval presence in the Okhotsk Sea, challenging the crumbling Japanese hegemony. Better motorized? Great. More GDP? Great. So 10 convoys? Even better. Um, let's do redirect the SIP plan or the arm Soviet Armed Forces. Home of the Revolution, develop merchant marine. Uh, invest in egalitarian schooling. But we'll do this first. It's become evident over the course of reunification that in modern warfare, military technological developments significantly influence the outcome of the conflict. Many theorists within the party have thus turned their minds to optimizing scientific output to further the reclamation of Russia by utilizing new advanced armaments and ensuring our Union's prosperity thereafter by developing civilian applied technology. One obvious method is for that to develop the academia extensively through the recruitment of new scientists. As thus been found detrimental that in the spirit of proletarian egalitarianism, potential intellectuals of all sexes, nationalities, and backgrounds shall be provided the necessary education and resources to construct research for the benefits of the Union. If we are to achieve this, first we must redirect our efforts towards eliminating the few remaining prejudices of the educational system. For instance, minority talent initiatives can be used to adduce those of ethnicities typically glossed over by higher learning. Cool. Yeah, more production is nice. Power grid? Eh, get more debt. We don't really want more debt, though. Stability? Eh, this one gives, does give us war support as well. Eh, for now, we can just kind of do this. Redirected transit. One problem we face when managing urban developments is the Trans-Siberian Railway. While its existence is greatly beneficial as the main axis of transportation between the cities of the Far East, the trans only covers the southernmost areas of the Union. Economically alienating areas are connected to it, including the prosperous ports of the Okhotsk Sea and the resource rich inland districts of Yakutia. While Saka's oil and gas reserve need little more than a pipeline for Magadan to fact remain port, a railway connection is vital. It has been found necessary to start constructing a new branch of the trans going north along the Pacific Coast, while extending a railway through the depths of Siberia's no easy task, and some are already dubbing it the construction project of the century, due to its difficulties of the initiative. The task itself should be relatively simple to achieve. Nice. More infrastructure is always good. Oh, look, our dead GB ratio is not bad. Uh, you know what, repurpose Soviet infrastructure? Why not? I'm okay with that one for now. Get more free infrastructure. Sell and convert convoys. Ah, there we go. Uh, we can do some of this stuff. Oh, that's not bad. We're gonna do transip. So, what do we want to do here? Increase industrial trade. Uh, I want more money. Production use is just so good. And increase GDP as well. And as well, expertise and industrial equipment. Weekly manpower. Ooh. We're gonna improve as well. Give it one more month, we'll get it higher anyways. When removed. You know, you might as well start doing this one then. Um, uh, it's 3% more. Oopsie. Third industrialization wave. Well, we didn't even do the second one yet. Whoops. Oh, well. Well, then, of course, yeah, we need to expand the industrialization plan beyond the great cities and allow summers, smaller cities to reap the rewards of Soviet industry. When we're done, every hamlet in the Far East will become a testament to the success of our laborers. Or laborers. Education is the future. Academic base and research facilities, eh? Ah, research is getting done too, so. Um, expertise. Yeah, we'll do this one next. That's from Manchukuo. The Japanese client city of Manchukuo to our south has historically been surprisingly developed, being at one point the third dominant industrial power in East Asia after Japan itself and the old Union. While the roots of this lie in Japan pumping resources and capital in its puppet state, their management of such resources presents a curious case. Or attaining the core tenets of fascist uh, state monopolistic capitalism. Manchurian models that came to be known largely main to avoid bureaucratic stagnation through rationalization of management, which allowed for the state to access, uh, exercise its power for the optimization of the wartime economy. This is especially evident in sectors of Manchukuo's heavy industry, which at times outperform those of Japan. While one resort to copying fascists, the Manchurian model does 
It does illustrate a few principles we can learn from, primarily in the sphere of streamlining bureaucracy. Brigade recruitment would not be bad. Increased production quotas? I'll wait for some more political manpower first. Recruitment is... Getting there. Aerospace industry? Ooh, the resor resources of Siberia. History shows that many nations' efforts to industrialize were hampered by a lack of resource space. Some lacked the metals for heavy machinery, some were short on fossil fuels to supply factories. Fortunately, the Union finds itself fully supplies or fully supplied itself from the inexhaustible riches of Siberia. While points have been made that a full scale resource based economy would be harmful in the long term, it's simply foolish to ignore the deposits of raw materials that could become a primary source of income. Although it's universally agreed that the economy should be diversified, investments in the resource gathering operations have been found necessary to supply our industrial complex in the process of modernization. Second industrialization wave. To order, in order to achieve our industrial goals, a second wave of investments into the state's heavy industry sector is needed. It will be a broad push for industrial growth across the Union, seeing the construction and local modernizations of several factory complexes in all our major cities. It ain't much, but it's still around 100%, so. Nice. Coffee, anyone wondering about better research facilities? Please go right ahead. For some reason, I forgot we had coffee. Nice. 65 planes, yes, please. Do I got more convoys? Ooh. A social utopia in the east. More population growth. Ooh. We definitely gotta do that one next. Develop the aerospace industry. Education is the future first. What little flaws the education once system one had, we have eliminated. Thanks for efforts of both realizing the Marxist principle of equality and enhancing the quality of education in our universities and life in our cities. The union is entering a new age of knowledge and higher learning. Soon, even the most optimistic predictions will be surpassed, and Soviet society will truly enter the technological age. Of course, this utopia of a proletarian mind will not come by its own. The academia must double their efforts on the cultural and scientific front of the revolutionary struggle, and whether sweet or whether swept, a new future of the people will be forged. As such, the union collectively and its, its every citizen individually must strive to better their education, for it is the future. Nice. Who has one stuff that's next? Develop the aerospace industry. Since the pitiful defeat of the old union at the hands of the fascist hordes, we truly demonstrated the full potential of the aviation. The third dimension of warfare, many have expressed their desire to invest in the aviation industry. However, with the relocation of Siberia, we lost much expertise, and now is the time we find ourselves our, and our industry capable of rearming the Air Force set up to modern standards. With the production base is already capable of producing airplanes, the main challenge we are poised with is a lack of technological insight. The remedy that's curious. The proposal has been made by a group of theorists. It includes various projects aimed to increase cooperation between the military and the scientific complexes, to ensure that the Union will reach the skies and perhaps one day... This, this, not the stars, but the stars. Regional councils... Sure. For too long, the over-centralization and departmentalization or departmentalism of ministries and within the Union has been allowed to continue, impeding both progress and efficiency. Perhaps nowhere else has such opinions been more observed than the economic sphere, and to address this, such committees take an action. Effective immediately, economic direction over the many of the Union's areas will be devolved, devolved to regional economic Soviets, known colloquially as the Sarnovkozy. These Soviets will be given authority within reason to determine the local economic and production goals tailored to the particulars and relative resources of their province. Decisions made by the Sarnovkozy and the particulars resulting from them will be consolidated for, by the central government. Analysis will be subsequently performed by the State Planning Committee in order to ensure to ensure both more efficient economic planning and more realistic production goals year over year. Although the basic needs for the Sovnarkovsky has been questioned by some who claim it as an unneeded dilution of state authority, both local and national party officials have made clear that their view of the ind individual Sovnarkovs uh, has been wholly in tune with the social spirit with cooperation at all levels. The time will tell such devolution proves beneficial. Local autonomy, central authority. Look at that. So about 100%. Uh, actually, that's not too bad. Oh, and you know what? So over 0.4 billion surplus, I'm okay with that. 6.7% growth, not bad. Actually, that's pretty awesome. Industrial trade. Um, I like that one a lot, actually. That's next. Um, with our recent industrial expansions, it's clear that we've made ourselves <clears throat> more competitive in the developing markets by seeking to expand our trade uh, with uh, deals with neutral states as well as a few handful of social states that still exist. We should be able to give a healthy infusion of cash in our state budget on a regular basis. Yay! Convoys, yes, please. How many convoys do we have? 
144. How many do we make a day? One? Two. Two a day. More than two days. That's actually really good. Nice. After that one, home of the revolution. Russia was the first nation to embrace the revolution of the proletariat, and despite all the challenges and setbacks she has faced, the motherland is still leading the charge. With the holder of the Far East secure, the time has come for the Soviet Union to formally re-enter the world stage. Though much of our union remains in the hands of the warlords and traitors, we cannot wait for total uh, reunification before reaching out to potential allies and partners. Russia suffered from diplomatic isolation for too long. At the home of the workers' revolution, we must lead by example. We cannot set an example for the workers of the world if we are seen as just another warlord rather than the legitimate successor to Bukhar and Soviet Union. The movement that began in 1917 never ended. We have recovered our momentum, and the time has come for the Soviet Union's triumphant return. Uh, increased production quotas? Uh, we could a uh, coal mining boom. Uh, I'll probably do expanding great recruitment. Not bad, so far at least. Oh, first I'm like, what, what happened to the focus tree? Cool. Home of the revolution. Um, the Soviet armed forces. When Boris Shalov and his sycophants elected to cower in Arkhangelsk instead of joining the president's evacuation in Arkutsk, the Soviet Union's hammer sickle found itself without a hammer for the first time since the revolution. Gone were its proud tank, artillery battalions, and air wings, presuming the general's vainglory, all rent and bone, into bone fragments and scrap metal along the AA line. Subsequent struggles against reactionaries and revisionists further chipped away at the armed forces only until what remained of the NKVD and its auxiliaries flew the Red Army's tattered banners. Suffice to say, the Union has recaptured much of its glory since. Its reinvigorated position in the Far East has brought in our options for a likewise restoration of the Red Army's invincible might. Yet we must not dally in doing so, for common to go to eyes westward, greater threats to the revolution the bandits and petty warlords. These states' armies will offer us no respite or quarter. In due time, neither shall we do to them. Back on the world stage. Workers, peasants, and soldiers of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics were about to embark on the return of the worker state to the world. The eyes of the press see the red banner hoisted once more, and all their hopes and determination rise with it. We shall soon stand side by side with those who share ideals and that all that stand against Nazi tyranny. Or bring the liberation of the Union, the destruction of the fascist jack put on the people and the freedom for all mankind in a socialist world. However, this task will, of course, will not be an easy one. The reactions are many, savage and relentless, in their desire to see the worker state extinguished. When the tide is turned, the dark days of the 40s and 50s are behind us. Our enemies will not succeed. History is on our side, and as it always has been. Now we take our first steps back onto the international world stage. I will say to our diplomats that I have full confidence in your skill, your devotion, and your loyalty. You, you shall be the vanguard of the revolution. Abroad, from today onwards, the oppressed nations of the world are no longer alone. Uh, again, at Kogoda, 1 o'clock of July 14th, 1968, our victory is inevitable. With war on the horizon, we might want to look into the expanding our volunteer recruitment and lower the standards for the volunteers that we do accept as well as providing volunteers with easier travel to the Union. Well, the influx of spirited men and women of so strong social convictions is undoubtedly going to strengthen us. I'll put further strain on our efforts to train our army. The Able Rearmament Program? Oh, yeah, that'd be good to do, too. That'll be next. And Universal Identification will be there, too. Man, that's some cold coffee, but whatever. So we've done forces. If you want to about the Guardians of the Revolution, please go ahead, as well as a co equal branch. But trust in the army. Midday in the snowy plains of Siberia, a guard's uh, battalion spots ramshackle hovels clustered a distance away. Colonel and the staff consult HQ's maps of village, barely a dot, beside the route to the rendezvous point. The men decide to approach and introduce themselves to its elders, perhaps secure provisions to supplement the rations. They expected to welcome conference of the liberators, like in the trickles of the Surovolv that made the trek to the distant east. Or Surovolv. The battalion departed with neither welcome nor provisions an hour later. Bloodshot stairs behind the rotting wood frames trailed their silhouettes until the horizon swallowed the whole column, or the column hole. Many more units will report similar stories throughout the broad uh, westward front. Each, le each lend credence to an issue heretofore unaddressed that the people have become so inured to warlordism as to treat any armed formation, even with their own protectors, like common marauders, must address it somehow. Bread Day. As the Red Army, of course, marched below the balcony, celebrating its most recent triumphs in the state's campaign of unification, the ranking officials who stood upon it knew the momental decisions were fast approaching, ones critical to the future. Or the civilian and military, all were aware of the struggles for uh, uh, for control between state factions, whatever the status of that struggle may be in the civilian government, had not yet been determined within the Red Army itself. 
On one side of the argument stood the NKVD, who some as the only loyal forces who had accompanied the Presidium to Irkutsk during the evacuation, claimed that they should be increasingly militarized to serve the loyal core of the future army. On the other side stood, uh, side, or stood the professional military apparatus of the Red Army itself. They countered strongly by reiterating that they had remained loyal during the Salvinite Rebellion and cast doubt on the combat ability of the NKVD, claiming that to restructure the military to accommodate them would lead to an enormous decrease in both tactical and strategic performance. No one knew what the outcomes of this argument were, already underway among the highest echelons of government, though, would be. But they did know that in the coming days, they were sure to find out an uncertain future for the Red Army. Recentralize the armed forces. Delegating control of the Red Army's operational tempo to the front lines, formations, field officers, rather than an all seeing general staff, many have, may have sufficed when its greatest engagements consisted of glorified skirmishes, raids, and counter raids against bands of organized thugs, or when fronts could be measured in hundreds of meters, not miles, or when signals equipment were worth their weight in gold for how few remain after years of combat losses and neglect. These conditions have changed, and not necessarily for the better. Comrade good clamors for war against warlords or equals in strength and resources, and whose borders likewise equal Russia's breadth. The comrades field marshal believe that he is no better. There's no better time now than ever. To reassert high command supremacy over the battlefield, doing so they advise will allow the Red Army to conduct operational art on, an un on a scale unseen since the Great Patriotic War. Better trust in the army. Coal mining boom. Hmm. Increased production quotas. Ooh, in order to achieve the goal set up by our economists, it's become blatantly clear to us that we need to raise the production quotas and all state owned factories. Oh, well, popular steps like this will be needed. We wish to avoid repeating the disaster. So, thanks to the last administration. And we'll come down here and do the next one here, too, with hiring foreign instructors. So. Ever training programs? Yeah, you might as well do that one too. With the new equipment comes new problems, as quartermasters and strategists are want to say. Ours now suffer this peculiar curse with the reintegration of old luxuries, heavy armor and air support in particular into their divisions. Like a dilapidated truck left to gather dust for lack of fuel, it forgets how to combat its engine, or combust its engine. The Red Army has forgotten how to fight like a proper modern army. <clears throat> the Ministry of Defense has begun addressing this issue twofold. First, by expanding the Union's military academies so as to accommodate lessons in tank and aerial warfare, and second, by organizing exercises which involve elements from all branches of the Soviet armed forces acting in tandem. Practice makes perfect, of course, so too will it make an invisible force in the Union's hands. Renew poverty, no matter what happens. And then, uh, develop the Merchant Marine? Why not? Because we can. We have a lot of power, which I love. The first step of rejoining the international community will be engaging in international trade. Siberia is a rich re region with bountiful resources that many foreign nations are eager to have access to. The North does not provide everything we need, however, which is why it's more important than ever we trade with the outside world to import ma important materials like rubber. Some might say doing business with capitalist empires is betrayal of the revolution, but the revolution won't get very far if our trucks don't have wheels. So to trade, opening trade with the outside world. We've arranged for the purchase of 100 merchant uh, vessels suitable for hauling large amounts of cargo. With this fleet, we can kickstart a new Soviet merchant marine and import all the resources we could ever need. Well, at least it's under 95% for now. For now. Growth is pretty good, though. And then what? Wings over Siberia, aircraft. Apologize for this long video, but I didn't want to get through all this stuff. In this episode, oh, it's not bad. All this stuff is not bad, but we can all wait for this stuff. So we'll keep going on this way. Peaceful coexistence. Ah, oh, sponsor the proletarian movement first. Across the world, the proletariat still struggles under the oppressive rule of their masters. Whether they are bourgeois capitalists or literal slavers, without the union, there was no strong nation to act as a guardian of the workers of the world. For three decades, tyrants around the globe took advantage of our absence, abusing and exploiting the lower class. But we're back now. Our financial and political resources are not what they once were, but we are now enough that we can resume our support for socialist movements in foreign countries. While we struggle to reclaim our nation from fascists and traitors, several other nations around the world took up the revolutionary banner in our absence. We should welcome them into the fold and begin working towards an international organization of socialist nations. Yeah. Worker training is really good to do. Good, good, good. I can do both at the same time, that's nice. I do not realize that. That there, Merc Marine. Not too shabby. Revolutionary aid? Ooh. 
Revolution aid funding. Well, let's do embassies on the liberated world first. Now that the groundwork has been laid, we can begin establishing formal diplomatic ties with their comrades around the world. By creating a system of permanent embassies, each staff by trained diplomats will open up the possibility of ongoing negotiations and communication between socialist governments. Embassies will also allow for more nuanced diplomatic tactics. The Cubans do things very differently than the Russians. And while delegation in Havana might suffer from cultural shock, an embassy there could hold Soviet emissaries who have spent years familiarizing themselves with the island and its people. The same is true for the nations from South America to Europe to Asia. Establishing a new socialist embassy as an instrument, instrumental step to creating a global proletarian alliance. We should send this proposal to our prospective allies as soon as possible. The longer we delay, the more time we'll give the fascists and capitalists to sabotage our plans. Where are we off for equipment? So, everything by admin efficiency is pretty much fair game. Yeah. As much as I want to do a coal mining boom. Ooh, we have to do this one first, so. Identification for all, and then again, empower the workers' organization first, that's fine. That is getting that done. But identification for all. The red booklet sits on the, t on the hand of the party, Aparachik, at the door, as Ivan Volkov looks at it dubiously. The man, smooth cheeked and plump, thrusts it almost out perfunctorily. Ivan the Volkov, citizen ID 7033434, three, your internal passport. Ivan looks back at him and takes it gingerly, the red star emblazoned on the cover, seeming, seeming to look at him. So what's this, comrade? Your travel frequently, Volkov. The party thought it best that you have priority for the IDs. No need to carry residential permits, met metrica, or travel permit, or worry about the wrong signature. This will do. If I'm not slowly, fingers closing around the passport, he grasps the door. I see. Thank you, comrade. Those will make things easier. Indeed, freedom of movement, comrade. A single paper, no worries. The wind picks up as little as the apparatchik leaves, uh, howling as if in laughter. Freedom. Ha. Freedom, 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 freedom. Free, dumb. Dumb free. Uh, Revolutionary aid funding. As part of our campaign to increase the diplomatic ties between the socialist nations of the world, we must provide a good reason for socialist nations to work together, and more importantly, work with us. The best way to incentivize loyalty and cooperation is with generous amounts of international aid. Someone calls bribery, but that is preposterous. Bribes go to corrupt politicians, while this aid will be going to the socialist leaders who attend, stand in solidarity with the proletariat. We're targeting our donations to specific parties and causes that align with their interests. We can encourage our fellow socialist nations to follow our lead and discourage deviation from the path we've chosen, after all. The Soviet Union was the first nation to embrace a revolution. It was our job to set the course and make sure that other revolutionary states stick to it. But if you want to read about increasing admin efficiency, please go right ahead. Yay! Oh, cold dates. Oh, crap. It's 69 already? Oh, Jesus Christ. That's not good. Um. Ooh, actually, growth. Oh, that's not bad. Hmm... Ah, do anyway, it's good again. Well, bad word. A lot of bad word. We can't afford a military that's really big. Can we? I don't think we can. Go and uh, do this one first, that's fine. Commonwealth, this would be, oh, this is going to be so bad. We might literally have to cheat here. Let's take a look first here. So, the divisions that we have right now. Not good enough. Just stack it full of arty. Uh, throw some recon for now. I know we had motorized earlier, but prepare for war. Oh, where is that? Right here. Crap. 0.65 plus billion. It's about to get a lot worse. Oh my gosh, we can't afford this. Well, there goes us. Great migration, I'm going to quit. Two words not heard on the plant floor in decades ring out as the foreman drops a bomb show to a six second. There's better work at the rifle factory, and I have an offer. In spite of the noise of the floor, the little space around the pair seems utterly still. Shouts ring out to the, along the line as stamped assemblies make their way to the end as the junior worker slowly, nervously polishes his glasses. Belov will be after you. You need him to sign the passport. B.S. A uh, paper gets waved at him. Cheap paper and stranded language of that. Public information leaflet. I don't need an approval to stay. I don't need to watch another boy get maimed in those machines. I'm going to where the management gives a crap. Belov can eat it. You're sure? Completely. The paper's passed over. The government's allowing switch. They don't need more stamps in the passport. Just a visit to the registry. 
He looks at the boy next to him. Too painful to earnest for an obsolete plant like this one. You want my advice, boy? You'll come with. The boy has turned the paper's turned over in a curious hands, and things begin to change. The worker may sometimes choose his work. Uh, peaceful coexistence. Our end goal might be global revolution, but for the moment, it's just not practical in the pursuit of this. The world is dominated by three giants, America, Germany, and Japan. Of the three, Germany is clearly the biggest threat, while America and Japan embody corrupt capitalism and tyrannical imperialism, respectively. They hate the Germans almost as much as we do, so we'll have to tolerate them for the moment. The word allies is too strong for what we want. A better term might be collaborators. America and Japan would benefit from a strong Russian nation to oppose Germany, and we benefit from a foreign aid for our request to retake the Union. As long as this state of affairs continues, it makes sense for us to pursue peaceful relations until we're prepared for more direct confrontation. I'm still doing this stuff. And then... The ninth five-year plan. Oh. The ninth five-year plan has been a resounding success. Not only have we bested the internal opposition and charted our own path towards improving the lives of our Soviet citizens, we've also managed a difficult feat of liberating another piece of old, old Union as a direct result of our diligent work. There's no time to rest as the has already approved the framework of the ninth five-year plan, one that allows to modernize the recently liberated Soviet Iberian territories to the west of our... Uh, so, so, liberated Soviet territories... Siberian territories to the west of our temporary capital forward. Nice. Can't believe John Glenn was just elected. Holy crap. Glenn all the way, baby. It's not good. Not good. Whenever the war starts, we're going to have to really just, like, win fast. But I don't think we can, to be honest with you. Land reform. More debt, but... Gives us more GDP. That's good. Where are we at? 1.33 sucks. 11% growth is pretty nice, though. That's a lot more debt, though. Whoa. Uh, we'll see what happens with this one. Support to the NAJUA. To our south lies one of the greatest acts of barbarity of the 20th century is playing out. The Japanese colonization in Korea is a tragedy that began in 1911 and has now ceased since. Not only are the Japanese attempting to erase the culture of the Korean people, but they are ruthlessly oppressing the workers of Korea and exploiting them for their labor. They are not unopposed, however. In northern Korea, the NAJUA, led by the freedom fighter Kim Il-sung, continues to struggle for Korean independence. Comrade Kim is a proud communist and shining example of commitment to the revolutionary struggle. Ever to coordinate international support for the NAJUA from the socialist nations, it will serve as an excellent show of our diplomatic potency and the strength of cooperation. This act of solidarity of the Korean people will endear us to all who struggle for the freedom across the world. I just hope we do okay. International reform. The towns have been established, embassies have been built and staffed, cooperation and collaboration between social nations have reached an all-time high. Uh, our diplomats are often asked about the next step in our plan to strengthen the global revolutionary cause, but they have kept their lips sealed until now. It's time they unveil the culmination of diplomatic efforts. We will recreate the internationals as a new political and military alliance that will span the across the entire world. This alliance of socialists and communist parties from around the globe will promote the revolutionary cause and fight against fascism and capitalist tyranny whenever they are found. The press of this role will quicken fear when they hear of this new alliance. They have fought so hard to advise, for they know that together we are stronger than them. A new day is dawning. That'd be good. Yeah. We definitely still need to have that one. Not quite there yet. Hey, 103%? Not bad. Winner takes all. Oh, good God. I don't remember which one I did last time. Mission to Tokyo? I want to say I did America last time. I could be wrong, though. So if you want to do it about this one, please go right ahead. As well as Amer request American recognition and apply for OFN funding, maybe? Uh, but we'll do the Japanese one, probably. Pull some planes, just in case. There's actually quite a few planes, which is actually really awesome. We have too many planes there, but that's okay. 
Tactical reassessments. While the Red Army's large formation shrank from the military district to half-strength divisions, its planners emphasized small unit combat over simultaneous front-wide attacks. Where the Red Army's air wings plummeted one by one in the Barbarossa, as planners disregarded air power as a force multiplier altogether. And when the Red Army's heavier assets, tanks, helicopters, artillery, and either stayed behind in the Urals or defected during the Siberian War, as planners utilized trucks with smaller arms to great extent. Shifting circumstances, after all, warrant a shift in priorities. Now the Soviet Union has regained much of the factories it had lost. Rearming divisions with armor and fire support will take time, but the average division will eventually enjoy unprecedented levels of available firepower. We should repurpose our war plans accordingly. Oh crap. So, with that in mind, I'm going to reload the save. And so that we're not training and doing stuff like that when they attack us, and they got way, 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 way more divisions. This is going to be a gigantic mess for us and not be very good, but we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about. Ooh. Procure anti-take equipment. Our men are steadfast, tough, and hardy in battle. In the face of armored units or hardened fortifications, however, these traits mean nothing. Every man can't damage his hardened tactics, will not be able to engage enemy armor on equal footing. Fortunately, there are many sockballs of anti-tank weaponry that have not yet been exploited. We need to go ahead and collect as many of these weapons as we can for a fledgling army. Asymmetric war asymmetrical strategies. Conventional warfare in Siberia is nearly impossible for us to wage. The front lines are simply too long for the amount of soldiers we are able to field. Mobile units act on their own will be what wins us a day. Able to coordinate over the endless tundra, our men will be trained to fight in the harsh, barren conditions. Hit and run tactics will be emphasized. Our men will be taught how to operate effectively in small units. As we have for years, we must make to do with what we have, and perfecting our use of asymmetric tactics will give us a much needed edge over other warlords. Focus on equipment quality. Our desperate straits following the Siberian War are reflected aptly on the Red Army's equipment, a haphazard mix of rifles, pistols, and support guns, some of which may have been in service in the siege of Peking. Fortunately, the warlords that had surrounded the Union were in, then it were in no better condition. This becomes less true as we push west, where the men will confront armies fled either by Siberia's industries or the trans Ural's ample stockpiles. The Presidium, under Comrade Goethe's advice, has given the Ministry of Defense industry a mandate to mass produce quality weapons for the Red Army's use. In this, they will be assisted by nearly every factory or division's reclaim. Imports from the West. No matter what the apparatchik boasts, reactivating the Soviet Union's full industrial might takes both preparation and no small amount of time. Time which the Red Army cannot spare if it tends to war be at war with Western warlords at the soonest possible date. We invite stresses to the tenuous logistics networks we have established by committing to such a schedule, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs may have found a solution to a temporary solution. The ports of the Far East, Magadan, Petropavlovsk, uh, Nikolaevsk, and Amur are open for trading with the U.S. and its allies. Their boundless industries have supplied the Union's forces during the Patriotic War. Perhaps we should consider revisiting this old relationship. Partition the army, uh, uh, commissariat. One of the biggest issues in organizing our armed forces. Footmen are just aren't just expected to garrison towns or be on standby in case of attacks, but also procure their own equipment, maintain their own gear, and buy and prepare their own food and so on. There are no specialized units in our armed forces to supply our men. While while acceptable for a small warlord, the situation is unacceptable. We'll never be able to reclaim our homelands with our army in such a disorganized state. We need a specialized logistics branch in our army. We need men who know how to procure equipment and transport it to men in faraway places. We'll need to specialize trainers, mechanics, and medics. Every man will have purpose in an army, which will greatly increase their fighting effectiveness. Or by the fleet. Russia has not a proper navy in over two decades. Now that we have access to the oceans once again, it's time to reclaim or make some investments in our shipbuilding capabilities. Hulks that are mothballed and can be recalled back into service should be called at once. Everything else not seaworthy should be scrapped and reused. Anything and everything that floats should be used in some way to assist in rebuilding the navy worth of true Russians. Rehabilitate the smugglers. In recent conquests in the Far East, many smugglers were captured, rotting uselessly in the prison of war camps. Many of these men are very experienced soldiers and navy men who are no strangers to navigate in the treacherous Bering Sea in the far northern reaches of the Pacific Ocean. It would be tragic to waste such experience. We should offer these seamen amnesty in exchange for service in our navy and wings over Siberia. We haven't fielded an independent air force for over well a decade. It's never been because we haven't wanted to. We simply never had the plans to justify or planes to justify the costs. Times are changing, but oh. With the recent influx of captured planes, combined with the greatly expanded industrial arsenal, we cannot finally invest resources into creating a new modern air force. The cost will be high, but the benefits far outweigh what costs. Air supremacy doctrine. It would be foolish to allow other warlords a chance to reclaim the skies for themselves. Why allow our enemies a chance to bomb our men on the ground in the first place? Our air marshals are pushing for the policy of air supremacy for our newly organized air force. Domination of the skies is key to winning wars in the modern age, as the Nazis know all too well. Modern warfare requires modern air support, and we will not fall behind. Our air force will be a key force in the future battles. Increase Japanese cooperation. At first glance, the idea of working with the Japanese seems preposterous. Their patch is to open the ally with the Germans of the last war and seize Vladivostok and her territory along the Amur, while we are at our back stern. We have every reason to view them as an enemy, and if the circumstances were different, we almost certainly would. Times have changed, though. Now, the facts are at each other's throats, and while the Japanese stole a city, the Nazis took so much more than that. On a practical level, it makes more sense to align with the Japanese than the Americans. Japan wants to see a strong anti-German Russia as much as America does, but is geographically closer and more, far more capable of providing direct support to us. And most of their differences aside, at least for the moment, I focus on the true threat, as we do a mission to Tokyo. Establishing a close relationship with the Japanese Empire will be no easy feat of diplomacy. The entire Japanese government is imperialist cult. 
which is rightfully afraid of our revolutionary ideal, or ideology. It'll take a lot of work by diplomats and negotiators to find an opening just to begin discussions. Only then we'll be able to show that we are truly interested in setting aside ideology and focusing on pragmatic cooperation. Our best opening strategy will be a Soviet diplomatic mission right to the heart of the empire. In Tokyo, our diplomats will be able to meet with their Japanese counterparts as well as influential politicians and military leaders. Once these connections are made, we can begin strengthening our ties, trade deals, embassies, joint development projects, and the list of opportunities goes on and on. And expand Manchurian trade. With the Japanese now are more willing to do business, we can finally start to benefit from their support. Our nation is positioned on the edge of the co-prosperity sphere, the largest economic bloc in the world. While becoming too integrated into it with CS is reduced to nothing more than puppets of Japan, doing business with the members of the sphere would be an enormous boost for our economy. To our south lies the Empire of Manchukuo, Japan's pet project and a burgeoning industrial powerhouse. The Japanese poured enormous resources into building a Manchukuo's heavy industry and we stand to benefit from our proximity. We have abundant uh, natural resources that we could trade for finished products to deal with the Manchurians along with developing overland connections between our nations is exactly what we need to kickstart the Union's economy in preparation for the reclamation. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will be definitely struggling against the Commonwealth of Siberia. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.